Ready? This <laughs> volume. Wow. Oh, I can't do it. Really Door right. shut, Scott. Uh, 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 okay. This is a gorilla podcast. A collection of interviews, conversations, and hangouts with some of our favorite humans. It's an opportunity for us to pull back the curtain and talk about how we all got here or are getting here. I guess you could say no edits. <laughs> That's not just true. uncut conversations about things we've learned, mistakes we've made, and all the stuff that keeps us going. It's another way we hope to be a little more human. A little more human. To be more human. (laughs) (laughs) There's something in there. All right. Welcome to episode 13 of A Little More Human. Today on the podcast, we've got Tyler Way and Kendra Clapp Olguin, right? Okay, Mm -hmm. good. I actually got it right. Mm -hmm. Um, Tyler is an artist, designer, a shoe designer, uh, and you've also, I mean, started has heart in 2011 correct yes cool kendra you kind of entered the picture a little bit later because you obviously didn't know tyler in 2011 but you once you guys got married you kind of partnered up in has heart right correct Mm -hmm. yep awesome and you guys recently just started a business called 1e1 so you guys kind of do branding design events what else do you do uh, it's kind of a mixed bag. So my background's in footwear design. So uh, work with different footwear brands and kind of consult and um, do a lot of creative work as well with brand identity and just uh, kind of telling stories through design. So sweet, sweet. So today we brought you in because we really want to talk about Has Heart, but I also didn't want to let you know, the other stuff that you guys do fall by the wayside because Has Heart is a nonprofit. It's been around for, oh gosh, how many years now? It's 2019, so like eight years now. You guys have been touring the states, the 50 states, uh, for the last two years? Close to, yeah. Just a little under, yep. So, and just recently, you guys had to hit pause. Yeah. Right. Because, uh, so you guys have been funding this because it is a nonprofit and people, you've partnered with brands, you've partnered with people that have been like believed in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, But can you maybe tell me a little bit about Has Heart and what it's, vision or mission is? Yeah, well, I think a good place to start is at the beginning and how we started. Okay. um, Because that's an important part. Um, And it simply started kind of like this when we're just talking over coffee. I was introduced to Michael Hyacinth. He's an eight-year Navy veteran. And just over our conversation, we realized the disconnect between his world as a veteran living in Grand Rapids and then my world as a creative living in Grand Rapids. Okay. Um, This was around 2010, and at that time, I had some childhood friends who were serving in Iraq and Afghanistan, and um, I felt a calling, I guess, to do something in case anything happened to them. And so we just kind of kept um, in in touch, and soon after that, Michael met a quadriplegic Marine who uh, a bullet uh, hit his spine and left him paralyzed from the neck down, but also damaged his vocal cords. So he was like a young 27, 28-year-old kid, basically, from West Michigan and lost ability to speak, communicate, you know, do just about anything. But Dude. Yeah, so it was pretty a heavy situation for, you know, anyone who's just hearing about it. Right. And we found out through his full-time nurse that he loved collecting T-shirts and had a huge collection in his closet. So Michael asked if he wanted to design one himself and his face lit up in a huge grin. That's awesome, because um, so, he couldn't talk. Yeah, all, he couldn't honestly. talk. He could smile. He could nod his head yes and no, um, but that was kind of the extent of his communication. And so I worked with him to uh, basically create a design that represented his story, and that was such a powerful process that Michael and I both knew we needed to continue partnering veterans with designers and helping them share their story and giving them a creative outlet. What was that? I mean, obviously we're on a podcast, but help me visualize that shirt. What What happened there? Um, so ultimately, so since he can only shake his head yes and no, I had kind of a list of questions just to get to know him as best yeah. as I could. And okay. um, so through about an hour's worth of basically asking him um, simple questions, uh, the last question was what his definition of a hero was. Mm. And he can communicate through an alpha numeric communication code that basically breaks the alphabet up into rows and letters that his nurse um, guesses. And so it took him about five minutes to finally spell it out, but he he spelled out total sacrifice. Um, And this was a guy that uh, (laughs) didn't even consider himself a hero. um, Which is crazy. Yeah, everyone in the room knew and and thought he was. So um, the shirt kind of uh, had his alphanumeric communication code spelling out those words, total sacrifice, 
with the American flag um, kind of vertical with the soldier memorial um, behind it. So, yeah, it was a very powerful. I've heard you process. tell the story like yeah. three or four times and I still have goosebumps. When that happened, did you realize right away like, hey, this is a thing that uh, there's a void. I can fill a void here. Or yeah. was it sort of like, wow, this was cool. And then all of a sudden it just occurred to you later on down the road. Like what, what did that process lead to? Yeah, no, it was a pretty instant like. Yeah, light bulb moment where, yeah, this yeah. is, you know, something powerful. This is a way for veterans to have their stories heard and to give them an actual voice. Um, and this is a way for creatives to kind of give back and learn more about them. Because historically, I don't know if there's any two worlds that are more distant. Um, when you think of like <laughs> right. the Vietnam yeah. era and protesting and like, you know, the creatives and the military side, they just don't interact naturally, I don't think, in most of our communities. And so we just instantly realize, you know what, this is a great bridge where we can bring these two worlds together. Yeah. So with that being said, Kendra, I mean, you you obviously came into this at a later stage mm -hmm. and then your experience probably has changed immensely over the last two years when it, when it comes to like interacting with veterans and mm -hmm. maybe talk about a little bit of your preconceptions you had because, I mean, your guys' vision literally says to build a bridge between the worlds of U.S. veterans and civilians. Um, what are you you might be a really perfect example of that kind of happening because you're working with all these people. I mean, you're setting up the events and doing PR and writing about them. So can you maybe talk about your experience in interacting with ve these veterans as like an example of how this kind of happens? Yeah, I mean, and even before I started working with Hasheart and these veteran, all the veterans that we partner with. So my dad's a, a Navy veteran um, mm -hmm. during the Vietnam era. And so I think I'm an example of like how close you can be to the military community, but still not know anything, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I grew up not hearing anything from him, and but I also didn't ask, you know what I mean? It, it was just kind of understood, but not really mm -hmm. elaborated on. Um, so when I started volunteering more and more with Has Heart, I actually got to hear more and more stories from my dad's experience serving in the Navy. Um, so that was kind of personally rewarding for me. Mm -hmm. um, Brought you and your dad a little bit closer. Yeah, why do you, totally. Why do you think you didn't ask about that? So, I mean, because that sort of gets to the heart of why this is a really great idea because you're prompting conversations through the work that you guys are doing. But there you are growing up. You're in the home with someone that has been through this. What were those barriers? Um, you know, so my dad is, he's a little bit older for, you know, my age, I guess you'd say. So okay. my friends' dads were a little younger and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so he sort of had a lifetime of experiences before uh, my sister and I sort of entered the world, right? And so he has traveled the world for different jobs and stuff. And I think to us, that was way more exciting than asking him about his military experience, you oh, know? Oh, okay. Um, although part of that is his military experience, mm -hmm. like traveling mm -hmm. the world. He got to go to like all sorts of places. Um, and so I don't know, I guess... Lack of knowledge, I think, as well. Like, I didn't fully understand that there were five branches. I didn't understand, like, very basic things until I started working with Hasheart. So I think, you know, not to expose your ignorance, you don't even, like, walk down that road, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so I think that was also it. Like, I just knew nothing, so I didn't know what to ask. Yeah. Huh. So, so That's catch crazy. us up to like currently, because obviously I'd say that you feel a lot differently uh, about <laughs> veterans and your relationship with them. And you also, your knowledge has just grown immensely. Can you talk about that experience a little bit? Yeah. I mean, so he is from a very small town in Northeast Iowa and he was actually drafted. Mm -hmm. So that to begin with is like mm. very, yeah. like, it's just a wild notion to me, right? Cause we're in a generation that we don't have the draft. We don't have to worry about this, like omnipresent, like, uh, possibility, the right? You up yeah. And you gotta go. Yeah, exactly. Or else you're going to prison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. like, or Canada. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or president. <laughs> <if you laughs> don't go. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, that to me is like an eye opener, right? And we've worked with veterans who have also been drafted. Um, and so when we ask them, you know, one of the interview questions that we have for them is like, what motivated you to enlist? And they're like, I didn't have a, you know, yeah. I didn't have a choice. Wow. Um, so that, I mean, wrapping my head around that is, like mind blowing. Um, but also his what? optimistic attitude about it was really great. He, he was like, this is my, this is my opportunity to get out of Iowa. This is my mm -hmm. opportunity to see the world. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. But okay, let's do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so he was like all about it. 
yeah. even though it was kind of put upon him. I mean, it was a possibility he was thinking about enlisting, mm-hmm. um, and I think maybe he would have. Uh, but yeah, so that also is like very interesting to me because I would be so intimidated if that were like the case for right. my situation. Yeah. You know right. what I mean? Right. Yeah. But so then you've got this. So you got this part of your story, your shared story within your family mm. that just isn't as discussed. And then you start to interact with Tyler and this organization, all that sort of stuff. Can you help us understand sort of how that narrative changed then for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's really easy to live in a world separate from the military communities. Um, I'll start with that. So it really could have been an easy thing to just like continue living my life. But it wasn't until sort of Tyler interrupted my flow. No, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm thankful for it. Um, and so I, at first when we started dating, I'm like, what? Like he's a shoe designer. He's like a creative, quiet, creative type. You know what I mean? Which we're going to come back to that. <laughs> the shoe designer part. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, what is he doing exactly? Like it took a second for me while I st- began dating him, like to really understand. Which, like, which is kind of the point, yeah. right? You're just like, well, this is mismatched because these people shouldn't be talking to these people. Like, right. You know what I mean? It's like, wait a minute. Yeah. No, let's get beyond that. Yeah, so it actually took me like a year uh, of dating to really like actually start, you know, volunteering my time with Has Heart. Like I didn't oh, really, really ju- yeah, it took yeah. it took some time. I mean, I was working and stuff also, like I had my own thing. So I don't know, it took time. And then once I started, I was like, whoa, because I was working. So I was a luxury retail buyer for um, a, all women's categories for a store here in Grand Rapids. And, and so like my world couldn't, you know, it also be further from really like, connected to, vet, from, to veterans in general. Yeah, yeah. totally. You're so, in a whole different scope subculture there. Yeah. So once I started sort of interacting um, with the both creative and military communities, it just like transformed my viewpoint on them because I think we have this preconceived notion of what a veteran looks like. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. my dad kind of falls into that stereotype. I mean, yes and no. I mean, when you get to know him, obviously he doesn't, but you know, white male Vietnam era, you know what I mean? Like older guy. If he listens to this, I'm sorry, I called (laughs) you old. Um, (laughs) But, you know, and so it really um, diversified like that, that image of what Mm -hmm. a veteran is. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And also it, it really is awesome for designers because you don't think that they would want to do something like this. And so your viewpoint on designers also changes that they kind of burst their bubble, step out of that mm. like comfort zone mm-hmm. and, you know, work with a veteran because, you know, it takes effort to do that. So can maybe, Tyler, yeah. can you give me a snapshot of what a day would look like when you guys do a Has Hard event so that the audience, if they have never heard of it, can get an understanding. And also we're going to put like the website and their Instagram and all that in the show notes after this, if you want For to sure. explore more. Yeah, so we facilitate a two-day design process between the veteran and the designer. And then we have a videographer and a photographer there to document it. Um, And I'll kind of explain kind of the process of as the veteran kind of begins to share their basic story. And so so we can have a list of questions that the artist can ask to just Mm -hmm. help spur Mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, But each day kind of starts with coffee. Again, that's an important part of our organization story and and future. Um, But it's kind of interesting how just simply sitting across the table from someone, sharing a beverage, sharing a meal, um, really kind of breaks down whatever barrier is already there. So that's kind of like the Hmm. first way we can kind of... Sharing bread. Yeah. Yeah. Like the person is a veteran or a designer or whatever, but first they're now a human being. Yeah. Like just another person. So yeah, like the first thing they have in common is they're both drinking coffee. So that's, you know, that's step one. At least it's a talking point. Yeah. 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 Um, And so we kind of just start getting to know each other. And um, as Kendra and I are kind of facilitating these questions, um, you know, we're asking follow-up questions to get a little deeper. And kind of the first day is like a get-to-know kind of day for both sides. And then the, you know, the designer shares as they go on. So is that going both ways then? They're both just sort of learning each other's backstory? Is that the idea? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like... It's like a date. It's like a blind date. And that's, <laughs> and that's kind of how like we brief them. Like yeah. it's going to feel awkward at first. It's yeah. kind of like blind a blind date. date yeah. But, you know. Awesome. I think blind can, dates can be fun. Yeah, they can <laughs> be. Um, and it's like a blind date with five people. So. Watching you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the worst kind of blind date. <laughs> 
Um, but, uh, you know, by basically lunchtime, everyone feels a lot more comfortable mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of the nerves are, are wearing off. And um, by the end of that first day, we kind of have a few loose concepts because we basically brainstorm with them with whiteboards and post-it notes and anything the veteran says or keywords or themes that we kind of see bubbling up, we'll write those down. Um, and then later kind of go back to them and start um, categorizing them and kind of seeing um, what themes are coming from them. And mm -hmm. um, we kind of break that first day once everyone's kind of like exhausted and, you know, there's just been this like brain dump. And so we usually will wrap a little early that first day and then come back the next morning kind of with fresh eyes on what, you know, our top concepts are. Um, usually the designer comes in with a few loose sketches and kind of helps the veteran visualize maybe what they're thinking um, and then we just kind of continue to refine that on that second day. And then we um, do a video interview and, you know, the portraits and stuff like that, that second afternoon. And then um, from there, the designer will continue to finish the design, um, you know, for the next three or four weeks. For the t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, for the t-shirt. And, and the we package, do an embroidered you do, patch. Yeah, you do a patch. And, yeah, so our apparel partner, Alpha Industries, um, helps produce and distribute all of that um, for us. And so it's kind of a... It's a two-day process, but it extends, you know, weeks and months after mm -hmm. um, the project. Cool. Do, do you feel like during that, maybe this is an obvious question, but do you feel like during that process, it creates an environment where someone could begin to articulate some things that maybe they just haven't had an opportunity to articulate? And what I mean by that is like, right, so you have like the the VA or you have you know, these sort of veterans organizations. And that's great because you're articulating, like, there's a solidarity there, right? Mm -hmm. But oftentimes then whatever those feelings or emotions or thoughts or whatever, they live within that space. Mm -hmm. Is there something cathartic about watching that take place sort of across those lines? Like, it seems like that would be really fascinating to observe. Yeah, it's, we're not therapists, so we can't call it art therapy, but numerous veterans have said this has been more impactful than years of therapy. Um, and we've even heard that from the creatives as well. Um, Why do you think? I think it's just having that much time to be introspective and to look back at your life. Yep. And we've heard time and time again where the therapy, they talk about the bad stuff that has happened to them. Whereas, yeah, and it also might only be like an hour of yeah, therapy. Yeah, and then, you know, you next week. On. Yeah. yeah. Um, but through this process, yes, they share some of the bad stuff they've been through, but they share more of the good stuff that helps them get through it. Yeah. And so they're pulling more of the positive stuff from their negative experiences mm -hmm. and kind of coming out with this personal mantra of like how I made it through and what message I want to share with civilians and other veterans. That I think there's something to it as well, where when you sit across the table from someone that maybe you've stigmatized, and I mean this like both ways, right? There must be something healing in that process to be like, wait a minute, the person listening here is actually someone that I just sort of assumed like lived on the other side of the aisle mm -hmm. and didn't really want to have anything to do with my story. Yeah. That mm -hmm. sort of an idea is, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I'm fascinated by that stuff. Well, That's some, cool. Sometimes we hear that explaining, well, sometimes, okay, so veterans relate to fellow veterans very easily, usually. Yeah. Um, no, not going to generalize, but, um, and so saying it to someone who isn't a veteran, sometimes it can be very intimidating because they think they're not going to relate. But then at the same time, we've heard that it's nice because they don't understand anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they feel like they really are like, it's a fresh slate. Uh, Does so that they make can sense? kind of, yeah, they can kind of create the story for them on some level and like get this a new experience. Right. As opposed to if maybe if they were talking to a fellow veteran, they would have preconceived notions or they would have their right. experience to or kind like, of... like, oh, yeah, or like the potential of like one-upping each other, like my experience was even crappier or yeah. whatever. Like it's yeah, not that necessarily... Worry, it, yeah, yeah, it totally, yeah. totally exists. And so, yeah, so we hope that this is like complementary to like the therapy that they do and stuff. And mm -hmm. it, I think, yeah, to reiterate what Tyler said, the time, like no one has two days to take off right. to really... In, you know, dive your into experience. your life. Yeah. And not only that, what I love about this experience is you, you get it out of you, like you put it out into the world. And then the designer, then the next day, maybe comes back to the veteran. And when do you ever have an opportunity to have a third person present your story back to you? Right. In, right. in a visual, in a visual yeah, way. And so rare. I think that experience is very unique. Um, and yeah, it's, it's amazing to watch. 
Wow. It's incredible. Yeah, that's so cool. That's so funny because, like, you're talking about it, and, like, we haven't even gotten to the part where, and then there's a T-shirt, which is sort of where it started. <laughs> yeah. But by doing that thing, you sort of unlocked this huge space where something awesome can happen. Yeah. And the T-shirt part is red, but that's just sort of like the, a the signal yeah. or the indicator of something much deeper, it seems yeah. like. So I guess that that sparks to where I wanted to go with you, Tyler, because I think a little bit of like, obviously the t-shirt is a really cool item, but I think it's really your curiosity that kind of like started this journey. So I want to take you back to like college days and kind of <laughs> yes. how you... This is um, fascinating. <laughs> I think the stories of like you sneaking into arenas, right? Yeah. That kind of stuff. I want you to tell me about your experience yeah. in college and how you started your artistic journey, because I think there's stuff in there that is the reason why it has heart has kind of been successful in your curiosity and that kind of well, thing. Well, and quite frankly, I mean, what you guys are doing right now, which we'll get into, like it, it's evidence of what's at stake for you. Right. It's not yes. like you're just like two people that were just like, well, we're bored and sitting on a trust fund and maybe we'll just try something. You know, like you've got you guys both like you have real talent and ability and you could be putting it in a lot of places. And the origin story of that is really fascinating because it really levels up like, oh, whoa, that's what mm -hmm. you were doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, to dial it back, I don't know, 10 or 15 years at this point now, uh, it was freshman dorm room. Um a broke college kid didn't couldn't afford you know new shoes so I was like well what if I just like draw on an existing shoe that I have and make it a little nicer and so actually I just randomly one day while studying picked up a sharpie marker and doodled on one of my shoes did a little design uh, my friend saw it thought it was pretty cool um, then it rained the first day and then like washed it all away <laughs> um, so I'm like that so didn't that last very long yeah. Yeah. somewhere <laughs> um, good so, test but at least like the idea was like oh wait maybe I can like design on my own shoes um, and so I, I figured out a way to use like leather acrylic paints and kind of develop this process to actually make custom sneakers um, and so I was kind of a part of uh, the basketball culture growing up in high school and you know, just love the sport, love the culture that came with it. And obviously shoes is a, a big part of that. Um, and so I kind of started from there just in my freshman dorm room trying to um, just do something fun for myself. And um, I got that to a point where, all right, I think I figured out like this process and this mm -hmm. formula. Um, what do I do with it now? And uh, I got a summer internship with the Detroit Pistons on the east side of the state. Nice. Um, coaching camps and clinics and things like that. And with that came a palace, um, Palace of Auburn Hills, which is no longer where they play, but um, I got a little ID card and um, kind of did my summertime there and then went back uh, to West Michigan for school in the mm -hmm. fall. Um, but then once the NBA season started that fall and winter, I went back <laughs> to the arena, still had my employee had ID, yeah. um, brought a little clipboard with me. Sneaky fella. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And just kind of like worked my way back into the tunnels, dodging Wait. security guards. And so you would just like, you know, just kind of like head down and like flash a card and just keep walking? Yeah. <laughs> the main thing is just pretend like you know what you're doing and just like keep walking. Dude, I my buddy used to play in the NBA and I've been in like those tunnels, like where the players enter. Yeah. That's no joke. Like there is security there. Like I'm trying to imagine you going through just like, and no one noticing. <laughs> like... <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, just it, him behind Ben Wallace, like nobody can see him. Yeah, it's too big. I mean, like a 5'10 <laughs> white guy, like he doesn't typically belong next to these huge. I'm a trainer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I kind of like was able to get in and then just simply waited outside of the locker room for some of these players to come out. And this was, I think, 2006, seven. So it was the Rip Hamiltons and Chauncey Billups and Tayshawn Prince. And yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. glory days for Pistons. Yeah, it was the good days. Um, and simply when they walked out, you know, I'm a shy, quiet person. I don't know how or why I even worked up the courage to introduce myself to them because they're literally two feet taller than me. Um, uh, just <laughs> huge human beings. Um, but they ended up being the nicest people, um, I've met and, you know, they could probably tell I was nervous and just kind of took the time to like shake my hand and hear me out. 
And I simply said, you know, I can custom design shoes for you. And um, at first, like, oh, that's cool, that's cool. Did you have like a pair on so they could see? Like, I had a pair. I had a pair on, but I didn't have any brochures. I didn't. Don't but think they could I had see a, your art. Yeah, so they could see yeah. like, like one example. This dude isn't just gonna scribble on one of my yeah. shoes. Um, so they kind of like nod their head and be like, "Okay, cool, cool. I'll think about it." Um, and I went back the next game and did the same thing and went back the next game and it took like four or five games. Yes. Oh man, and there's, there's yeah. a lesson in this though, yeah. right? Like, there's the kind of persistent there's persistence where you're just like, "Dude, you gotta stop," right? And then right. there's the other kind where you just you have to stay that you just have to be present. Because no one's going to say yes to you the first time. Yeah. By time number four, they're like, all right, this dude's for real. Either that or I need to get him off my back. So yes. I'm just going to, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so Probably finally, more the latter. Yeah. <laughs> so finally, Tayshawn Prince brought in a pair of Air Force Ones for me to do. And I, I did that. And uh, he loved them. Um, asked how much they were. I told him, he's like, oh, I don't, I got to go borrow money from Chauncey Billups. So he like, I love that you had the balls to then charge him for it. <laughs> I think most people would have been like, oh my God, like he's into it. Oh, but uh, it's you, awesome. You actually charged him the money. <laughs> and, like there's a business. You had to ask, which is brilliant. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I ended up borrowing money from Chauncey Billups, which I thought was <laughs> funny. Um, and then like Rip saw the shoes I did for Tayshawn. He's like, oh man, so... The next game, Rip brought in three pairs for me to do, and then three more pairs, and then his shooting sleeve for the three point contest. And it just kind of continued to evolve from there. Wow. So that's pretty crazy. awesome. So, how does that? So, then from there, now you're, now you're the shoe guy. Like, how does that evolve into what you were doing prior to Has Heart? And, and you feel free to, like, I, I mean, like, all the way up to like Wolverine and that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got to a point where I don't want to be known as the custom shoe guy because I think you can get pigeonholed yeah. in that pretty quickly. And you're an artist, so you're like, yeah, don't and define so, me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so I wanted to kind of evolve myself a little bit more. And so through actually doing the shoes, I developed like a pointillism technique. Um, and that I did onto some large-scale canvas work and continued to do some art projects um, for some NBA players on a different medium. Uh, but also I wanted to learn more about actually designing shoes. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. uh, I finally learned about Wolverine Worldwide, which was basically in our backyard. And, you know, they own 10, 12 different uh, brands. And so I was like, huh, I can you know, want to figure out what's going on there. So I got actually Wolverine Company store opened in downtown Grand Rapids. And I about that store. Yeah, 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 I yeah. would be in there probably three or four times a week just asking the manager questions and looking at the shoes and all this kind of stuff to the point where he asked, like, do you just want a part-time job here one or two days a week? <laughs> like, you're so Wait, annoying. so you're doing this incredible art and then just... Hustling up. the shoes, like yeah. it's not like you just went right into designing. No, it was it was a process, and so finally I got a one or two day part time job there, and it was kind of like the flagship store um, for the corporation, and so a lot of people would come down to the store and check it out, um, and so I was able to just meet some executives and mm. design directors and stuff that came into the store. Um, and then I learned about a, a position that opened up in the Sebago brand for a color and trend specialist. So I applied to that, um, didn't end up getting it. Um, and that's because the design director kind of saw my custom sneaker portfolio. And he's like, um, I think he just happened to see kind of himself in me. And it's like, I just want to bring you in um, as like a part-time contractor um mm -hmm. and kind of he kind of he was giving you the freedom me. to yeah. not get locked up into something yeah so he knew i didn't know how to design shoes but yeah he hired me to design shoes and i think it <laughs> yeah. was just, wow um, that's rad yeah right place right time and a right person where he saw mm -hmm. enough potential to be like you know i think we can kind of train you one thing that i note of there just in keeping with sort of the theme of the podcast is like i love like you're so humble about it you're like oh right place right time after like a hundred times of inserting yourself into the right place in the right time, right? So it's like, yes, like there is a degree of luck oh, within absolutely. what all of us do in the oh, yeah. creative industry, right? At the same time, like you do weight those dice, right? If you just expect that luck to just happen, it's not, you have to be persistent mm -hmm. in putting yourself in those positions. And also like that humility to be like, on the one hand, I'm working with these NBA players 
and I'm just going to go work out of this shoe store and try to right. find my I, way that's in. That's what I was fascinated by. You're putting by. yourself in that position so you can be in the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, I just mean that because so many, I think, of who listen to the podcast are oftentimes saying, well, how do I do this? Like, how do I make it into a creative position or a position where I have some creative influence or whatever? I, I don't know. Maybe you have a thought on that. I don't know. But I think that I admire your persistence and humility while at the same time knowing your value. And those things like go together, I think. Yeah, I think it's just putting yourself out there enough. Because that's if after I first introduced myself to players and it didn't work out, I could easily just not gone back. Be like, oh, that didn't work. Yeah. Um, And the same with, you know, the shoe thing. Like, oh, I didn't get the the position I wanted. And and so it's just continuing to, I guess, have your vision and work backwards as to, okay, what are the next steps I need to take in order to get to that next level that I want to be at. You're also willing to like do what might be perceived as something that is like lower than what your skills are, which was work at a shoe store, Mm -hmm. which I think like, like you said just a second ago, I think that's the willingness to do that kind of work and pursuit of the larger thing is monumental. How do you draw that line? Because I think a concern for a lot of people trying to work their way up the creative ladder is on the one hand, I know that, you know, pushing a broom on set or whatever is probably the way in because creativity takes trust. You know, those industries are built on trust. At the same time, though, you push that for too long and you will become the broom guy, right? Like, how do you strike that balance? Yeah, I think it's just kind of knowing, okay, how do I first get my foot in the door? And then from there, how do I continue to open that door a little bit wider each time? And so if it is just getting on set, um, I, I think soaking up, the knowledge, asking questions, just kind of being a fly on the wall and not being afraid of asking too many questions. Mm, that's um, great. Because I think whenever people get asked questions, they'll get to know you mm-hmm. and then they'll get to know you more and more. And mm-hmm. that's, mm-hmm. you know, it's all about mm-hmm. relationships and um, building those and, and learning as you go. Um, and so I, I think if you're just the broom guy constantly pushing the broom, then you're not going to get far. But if you're the broom guy that stops and asks questions and, and soaking up everyone else's knowledge in the room, then I think, you know, you're making your way into that next role for yourself. Absolutely. That's great advice. That's I awesome. That's really Dang. great advice. Wow. So with that in mind, you you are a designer when you started doing these events for Has Heart. You're mm-hmm. like actually working at Wolverine Worldwide at this point. Like you, you have a pretty great job. You guys, wh- when did you meet Kendra? Because that's when there's mm-hmm. a, also because Kendra has stakes in this as well. She wasn't just like, ah, whatever. I'm just gonna start doing has heart. Like you actually had some personal changes of like, you know, you're working in an industry that you're selling four hundred dollars shirts mm-hmm. and yeah. um, that kind of thing. But yeah. I'm curious, like you were like, actually, I'd like to do something else with my skills instead. You said this too. Like I heard you say this before. Just sort of the juxtaposition of what you were doing versus what you were then seeing happen. Can you dive And I'm also, that by the way, I'm not bit? knocking, like, if you like $400 shirts, that's right. fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, if that's it's for a personal you, thing. Yeah, if that's a, for you, go for it. That's it, okay. But, like, I'm like you, for you, you were like, I wanted something and, else. And right. so many of us are in those positions, right, where we are doing one thing, but then we see this other thing. We're like, you know what? That actually speaks more to whatever's Me. ticking, yeah. like, inside of me. Yeah. I want that. So it's less about, like, dissing on what you were doing before, but more about like something that's attractive to you and then and then not settling for what you have, but instead like sort of going for that, I think. Yeah. So <laughs> why are you smiling at me? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I met Tyler through the store that I worked at. He um, knew my boss and just would visit from time to time. And this makes me sound annoying. I feel like I'm I just know. like, you're always visiting yeah. at different yeah. places. <laughs> I'm always like tapping you people on the shoulder. We met Tyler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. No, it's great. I the love truth it. comes out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool. He Every, really was just going to visit you. Yeah. Right? He was like, I came to visit my boss. <laughs> yeah. So he, he came in and, and it was really funny because my my coworker Matt Sova, who is well known in the Grand Rapids community for it's being very true, very fun and whatnot, um, and very fashionable. So Matt thought he was cute. And Matt loves this story, so I don't have a problem sharing this. This is um, great. 
Okay, so well, Matt thinks Tyler is really cute and asks my boss, like, hey, like, does, you know, is Tyler, like, dating someone? And my boss knew that Tyler was not gay, but <laughs> wanted to put Matt in, like, a very awkward situation. <laughs> and so he was like, Tyler, are you dating anyone? And Tyler was like, yeah, I'm kind of seeing someone in New York. And at the time, I had just ended something with someone in New York. And so I was like really bitchy. And I was like, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> and like, apparently he was really turned on by my bitchiness. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, he liked me. And I could tell, I mean, we both were like, it was like kind of like this sort of I don't know, energy between us. I feel like we both have talked about it since then. Like we were pretending not to look at each other. You know what I mean? But we were <laughs> like fully aware of our presence. Like, oh, you know what I mean? Cool. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. Classic. Classic. Uh, so yeah, so that's how I met him. Eventually, like he messaged me online and stuff and, you know, asked me out and it was really. It was online. Yeah, no. it was actually right when Instagram uh, message started. Oh, you DM'd her? I did. No! <laughs> it, like, when it was the first DMs. <laughs> it was yeah. like right when they uh, introduced like photo, like photo in the messenger, not oh just my text, gosh. you know? Did um, you take a selfie and send it to her? No. no. So I was actually in China um, <laughs> on a factory visit um, for my job and just doodled a little, you know, if I wanted to get to know you better, would you prefer it to be over? And then I had like get out a wine glass, you know, uh, like <laughs> beer pitcher, milkshake. Yeah. And then the last option was now's not a good time. Yeah, which I make fun <laughs> of him because I'm like, why didn't you give me an option of like, just no. Because <laughs> I wanted to be put down gently. If I was gonna be put down. So I had to you put down You didn't just want to be ghosted. Myself. This way you're not getting ghosted. <laughs> yeah. At least there's an answer. There's an out. <laughs> so which one did you choose? A wine glass. And I actually only <laughs> sent a wine emoji. Like I didn't send any other text whatsoever. I just sent a wine, like a wine glass You guys emoji. are playing the game probably. Like you get just this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're like, cool. That's all you needed. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. So, yeah, so the rest is kind and this of... this is... Well, give us, like, a timeline, because, like, this is... This is 20... I don't know. 13, I always confuse. 2012, 2013. I think it was, two, think it was 14. 14. Because you guys just went on the road two years ago. Well, and we yeah. should establish yeah. that, too, because we sort of established the idea of has heart, but we didn't transition it, right? Yeah. So right. Oh, yeah. maybe if I can just kind of bring us up to yeah, do speed. Do like, so obviously you have this career that you've developed... And you guys just met, right? And so you're both at a turning point where you both have your kind of thing that you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. How does that then transform into what you're doing now and help everyone understand what it is that you're doing now? Yeah, so for I was a footwear designer for five years at Wolverine and um, still doing Has Heart nights and weekends with Michael. And so every year... We would partner five veterans and five designers um, basically for a design week in Grand Rapids and exhibit their designs and stories at Art Prize every fall in Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that was kind of our big fundraiser for the year um, where we were able to sell the, the products that would then um, fund the next year's project. And so we did that for five years straight. Um, and Kendra and I were dating and getting more serious in our relationship. And I kind of got to this point where I was also getting busier with my corporate job because I was kind of going up that corporate ladder mm -hmm. and so traveling a lot more um, and just a lot less time for things like has heart. And mm -hmm. so it got to this point where it was either going to fizzle out as Michael and I got more busy because he has a family and have a career and relationship. And so it was either has heart will fizzle, fizzle out um, or we can do something drastic and see what happens if we put ourselves into it completely. And we were, and, and Ken, Kendra and I were engaged at the time and kind of starting to plan a life together and a wedding. And I kind of just approached her with this idea of, uh, you know, what if we take Has Heart across the country ourselves and just simply see what happens with mm -hmm. it. Um, because that was kind of the only way. Because this is so exciting. <laughs> yeah, that was the only way. Like, has heart was really going to continue on because it was basically right. self-funded all through those first five or six years, um, and it was you know hard hard to do that and make a living. And so Kendra was at a position in her job where she wanted to get back to you know writing and communications, and that was kind of her background in college. 
Um, so I think I was able to kind of rope her into mm-hmm. <laughs> the concept <laughs> enough. Cool. And I think the big selling point was um, we'd be able to pull our own bed with us um, because she loves the consistency of like home and she's like a home body. Mm-hmm. And so like, I think my selling point of taking across the country ourselves is that we literally can pull the bed in our home with us wherever we go. So you guys designed a model where you're basically truck and trailer going state to state with this thing. Mm-hmm. Where did that idea come from? Um, I, I don't just, even know exactly. Well, I think well, I just you... knew I, we had to do something big in order to get the attention of... Right, because you're actually trying to have an impact and you're, with your mission. You knew it was... Yeah. Ha- locally, it worked, but you wanted this to happen nationally. Yeah. So and in order to do that, you have to raise the stakes. Yeah. Well, and, you had a moment even when you sold your like when you sold your condo and stuff and you were trying to figure out where to live next, you kind of had a moment where you're like, I would really like to live minimally and buy an RV. And I was like, what the shit? Like, what? Like, <laughs> I was like, where is this coming from? And he was like sending me Craigslist links of like 1982 Winnebago. And I'm oh like, Oh my what? God, yeah. this. You Sounds familiar. <laughs> Eric is going to get real excited. Same thing. <laughs> and I'm, like, I'm like, are you sure about this? And maybe that was your way of like testing my reaction to like living in a small like mobile home, but I was just like, what, where is this coming from? But I think like this idea of living on the road, living minimally, like really having what's important to you, I think Mm -hmm. fell in line with the growth of has heart that also fell in line with like our relationship and like joining two lives together and stuff. So it really was like a serendipitous moment of like, how can we, you know, funnel this all into one Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. and create a life for ourselves. Yeah. Cause you guys got, you, you, Correct me if I'm wrong, but like you were engaged and you're like having all these ideas, you're going to maybe hit the road, but then you got married and didn't you hit the road right after you got married? Yeah. So, um, we got married in May, almost two years ago. And, uh, then we took a quick honeymoon trip because everyone's always like, what a long honeymoon. And we're like, no, we're brats. And we actually took a honeymoon <laughs> before we even hit the road. So like really mm. quickly. And then we came home and it was like a week and we like hit the road in uh, beginning of July of wow. 2017. I think like the thing that's so interesting about about this, and when I first met you guys, I think there is I definitely felt a sense of solidarity because I have a trailer and <laughs> get in there and drive across the road with my family and you know or across the country or whatever. I use it more as a, like a escapism to just try to like reset just from the chaos. But immediately, like I resonated with what you guys were doing is because. Um, I think when I did it, I was like, oh my God, like it's been like 10 years without like a significant like vacation. I need to take a sabbatical if I'm going to survive, like in, in my case, like the creative industry or whatever. But for you guys, it was different. And mm-hmm. what stood out to me so much is that like, you really did sacrifice a lot to do this. And I'm not saying that it isn't fun, but I think that in like you know, social media era, especially like Instagram world, it's just like, oh, two millennials on the road living out of a trailer. How yeah. cool. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But the reality is, is that you gave up a lot to do that and you did it with a higher purpose. And I think that's right after just getting very married. important to like point <laughs> yeah. out that's different. Yeah. Like you put a lot at stake. Like you could have continued down a very comfortable path. Why didn't you? Why did you feel so compelled to to take this to you know, to the road to go to, you know, all the states and and bring has heart? Um, I think it was just knowing the impact it can have on people, having experienced it for five years myself at that point. Like I, I knew there was something special there and I would have a hard time living with myself if I just like let that go by the wayside and then just mm-hmm. pursued like my comfortable corporate mm-hmm. design job. So I felt like I had that purpose where I needed to kind of take that leap of faith. And um, it wasn't exactly doing everything ourselves because we also saw the opportunity where there's this infrastructure of designers. And so um, what I haven't shared is that in 2015, we partnered with AIGA West Michigan to do our Hero Series project. And then in 2016, we partnered with AIGA Detroit. And so... AIGA, uh, for people who don't know, it's the organization or association for institute. What is it? 
Oh, is that why you're looking at me? Yeah. <laughs> Dig you out of this hole? Art it's, stuff. It's, yeah. yeah, it's the American oh, God, Institute of Graphic Arts. Spot. Yeah, um, but it, it's just known by AIGA. But it's this professional organization of design, and they have 74 chapters mm-hmm. across the country. Not to mention like numerous student chapters. Yeah, okay. and so I think knowing that there are all these chapters in different cities kind of laid that initial um, idea of going to different cities and right. doing these veteran and designer projects. Well, it gave us like a confidence of, of okay, we're risking X, Y, Z, but at least we have something to kind of rely on. Mm-hmm. We have connections that we can, you know, pursue and stuff. It wasn't so just it, blind, like we're right. r- rushing off. Yeah, the, like it yeah. was a little Dark. bit more strategic than just, you know, hitting the road and seeing what happens. Mm-hmm. And so we saw mm-hmm. like this national infrastructure of designers and know that the designers that are part of AIGA are very passionate about, mm-hmm. you know, doing good in their community. And then there's obviously this national infrastructure of veterans um, everywhere across mm-hmm. the country as well and numerous veterans organizations that we could partner with. And so we kind of saw, okay, there's these people already in these communities. We just are going to be like that connection point that brings them together in each place. So what was the goal that you left with? You left with a specific specific objective, and I know it's obvious to all of us, but just for the sake of the podcast. Right. Right. So the goal was to visit each state in the U.S. and partner one veteran and one graphic designer in each state and document that through photo, video, and text. So we also hire a videographer in each state as well, um, which is honestly, one of the most difficult things to do is finding that video. Yeah. Um, uh, and so that at the end will be a collection uh, in a coffee table book, a documentary film, as well as a traveling art exhibit that we hope will sort of emulate the the route that we took. Um, and this tour is also kind of setting the ground for the communities that we visited um, to continue partnering uh, designers and veterans, whether that's hopefully through the AIGA chapters or just through the designers that, you know, experienced it and mm-hmm. would like others mm-hmm. to experience it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's our goal sweet. is to kind of build well, a foundation where we can hand this project off to people in different communities mm-hmm. to continue partnered veterans and designers and sharing their stories so the locally while, yeah, while also like building a national um, place for these stories to live. So, so can cool. maybe tell, where are you at in that goal? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> my next question really has to do about like, you guys had this dream um, and alongside dreams, there's generally a lot of fears and anxieties and like, oh no, will this happen? Yeah. So I, and I think that kind of, you're, you're kind of at that moment right now in, yeah. in currently in time. Mm-hmm. So talk about where you are in that. Yeah, how far have we gone? Yeah, so <laughs> we've been able to visit 37 states so far, uh, we hit the road July 2017, and then just after the new year of 2019, our initial round of funding kind of ran dry. Um, and so that's w- when and why we had to pause the tour for a little bit, because we were able to raise um, about $100,000 through a grant from AIGA, um, and then sponsorships from Alpha Industries and Bates Footwear and other consumer brands to get us on the road. Um but while we were on the road, we were so busy connecting all the projects where we kind of forgot, oh, wait, we need to continue raising the last $100,000 mm-hmm. we need to finish. And so somehow, I don't know how we stretched it to 37 states. but We, we got pretty far. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so we we're just like, ah, uh, crap. And we were in the South. We were in Florida at this point. And um, the organization was basically completely out of money. Personally, we were like, had been out of money for months before yeah. that. Um, well, and one we'll thing that- I want to really point out, it's really important to point out like that money that you guys raised, because I've seen, you know, the efficiency with which you live, like that money's not going to your lifestyle. That money is putting you in a position where you can host these events. I mean, that money's got to, you've spread that across 37 events in 37 different states. Like, And I know you've also done one in Hawaii, like not with a trailer, obviously, but like, that's insane, right? Like the, uh, 
the stewardship of those resources is pretty impressive. So I think that's just important to like note. Note. Yeah. 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 Especially like what you said earlier, you know, when you live in an age of Instagram and you see like these millennials and van life and stuff, it looks very romantic and whatnot. And it's reality is like, that's actually the cheapest part is like going to national parks. You know what I mean? Like that's the part that like doesn't cost money, but like putting on these events, like, yeah. Um, Tyler was just, you know, working on the website in which he did like a pie graft in which the, where, where the funds go to and it's like the vast majority are you know program yes because yeah. you guys live bill. off like a <laughs> stipend yeah. and it's a and it's a small stipend well yeah <laughs> it's essentially to go toward you know affordable care act woo uh, <laughs> health care and um you know yeah. basic food, food right? <laughs> yeah. those two things really well we bought the Airstream ourselves and I made sure to buy it while I still had a full-time job so I could get the loan because <laughs> otherwise there's no way I would have no gotten that. <laughs> yeah, really. um, and then uh, the rest, you know, was uh, kind of the truck and stuff. We worked with uh, Todd Wenzel and his um, Chevy dealership and got a, a Chevy truck lease kind of donated partially. Wow, that's amazing. They donated it to you, huh? Yeah, they, they helped with yeah. the, the down payment and then we covered the... Um, monthly payments after that and are kind of at a point where, okay, now we need a, a truck again because our two-year lease is, is coming to an end. So mm-hmm. um, yeah. we're still figuring out ways to finish yeah. these last 13 states. But yeah. Um, yeah, ultimately it was trying to figure out what we can do with what we have. And yeah. one of the things that um, we wanted to make sure we did was pay all of the participants at least a little bit. Um, and that includes the veteran, the designer, and the videographer. Um, I started doing photography myself on a lot of the projects just to save on um, that cost. But we wanted to make sure we especially valued their time. Right. Can you, I think that one we probably should like dive into a little bit, right? Because if you're on the outside and you've been hearing this story, you'd be like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Why are you paying these people? I thought that this was an altruistic sort of experience or whatever. And I, I think being on the creative side and like how it communicates value mm-hmm. to people, it's not, no one's getting rich off of this, but it yeah. is a way to sort of say like, it's something. your skill yeah. is worth something. Can, can you help people understand why you would do that? Yeah. Well, well in partnership with AIGA. So yeah. um, there were like key people to get this project started. One of them was AIGA. We got the Innovate Grant in 2017. And one of their, um, I guess, missions as an organization is to like promote the um, like the dignity of a creative uh, career. And what that entails is like pain, pain, right? Yeah. Yeah, Pain for, for your talents and skills, just like you would pay for any other person that's perfect, you know, like a professional. So that is like sort of like indicative of the industry, right? It's just like, you wouldn't ask someone to come like do plumbing in your house for free, but it's so easy to be like, Hey, you got a camera. You want to just come over and just take some photos? (laughs) Yeah. And so I think focusing on the value, I mean, part of, and that's why we connected with AIGA because here we are, our mission is to, you know, unite these two worlds through design. We obviously know the the value and the power of design. Like how could we not honor that and pay people for that, you know? Mm-hmm. And then same thing on the other side, right? Like you're also for the veterans, for the veterans. As oh well. yeah. 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 I mean, that's their, that's content, you know, that's the inspiration behind the design. Like we're not trying to value it, um, you know, by monetarily speaking, but we do want to honor that as well. And then not to mention when it is a t-shirt, um, that specific veteran gets uh, 25% of the sale, the sale proceeds, you know, after we go toward like production costs which and so stuff, cool. which is so much. I love that. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. awesome. So you were at this crossroads really, and you guys are kind of at the asking point really, right? I mean, mm-hmm. cause you guys are still, you're going to be doing a, a round of fundraising to continue this mission. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is the question that we've asked you many times, but I I think it's important for the podcast audience to hear, like, why are you still going? Uh, Because like you, you have done an incredible job. I mean, you've gone to 37 States. You you have definitely made a huge impact at this point. Why keep going? And and you have marketable skills, right? It's not like you're just like, Oh, what do we do now? I mean, you could, you started your own business. And I don't, and and it's really important to, to point out, like, I don't just mean Tyler. Like, I, for me personally, like, I, I'm in a space where, you know, my my sort of creative insanity, if, like, not for, like, my partner, 
would be absolute chaos. Mm -hmm. Like I would just start fires everywhere and then they would just grow into chaotic blazes <laughs> that would be spiraling out of control or whatever. So like, I really think it's important to point. Well, out. I know this literally like, because you yeah. taught your kids how to build a fire recently, right? <laughs> so I think that's a pretty literal <laughs> metaphor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like it's so important. I think to like to there there is this the reason this works so well. Maybe I'm diving back into it, but the reason it works so well, as I observe the two of you, is that you're both bringing this unique ability to the table that, when combined gives sort of this artistic sort of energy and then sort of intense like um, organization and structure and way to tell the story of what you're doing. And both of those things kind of make this powerful. And through that, like as you observe what you guys have done, you could just quit now and you both would be in this position where you could leverage what you just did to make yourselves incredibly marketable to move back into, you know, jobs and traditional sort of life and all this sort of stuff. Why not just do that? Why keep going? You want to answer that or me? No, go for it. Okay. I'd like to hear from both of you. Okay. okay. Yeah, because yeah, I think yeah, like... I, it's I, just actually, like what, Kendra, I'd yeah, like Kendra, to hear from you. <laughs> Kendra, <laughs> it's important because you're doing all of these things during this process that yet, like, maybe to the outside, it's not as sexy as like the design part. But because I'm on the inside of, of like this industry, like... For me, I'm like, oh, thank God. There's someone that's like holding this shit together. You know well, what I mean? It's like, so funny that I'm just laughing. The reason why I wanted Tyler to kind of lead the way was because I am not the organized person. You know what I mean? But Which you're is, the storyteller. Right, totally. I yeah. know. Like, I think between the two of us, we hit what you just listed, yeah. but it's not necessarily split, you know, yeah. which is fine, you know. He's the the organized one, and you we are very of, organized. Yeah, <laughs> so organized. <laughs> but weird. you're you're yeah, but you're sort of taking this narrative, and you're helping everyone understand what it is. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I think we complement each other as much as we argue and bicker and stuff. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, we're on the same team, right? <laughs> right, yeah. um, um, what was the question? The why? So no, why are you yeah, still so going? Oh, oh, going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could leverage this. You could parlay this into whatever you want. Now. Yeah. I think it's an obligation. I think one thing that we both share is like an extreme loyalty, uh, to like our people. Right. Mm. And so now we've created like this family, this community of people that have, you know, con connected across the country as well. We've seen veterans, um, you know, Facebook friend, a veteran like in the East Coast when they live on the West Coast. And we've seen designers follow each other and designers follow these veterans. I mean, it's like crossed all sorts of barriers. And so now we are just like, we need to finish this because, A, we know 13 more people, that's 26 more people plus the videographers. Like we still have so many people to like reel in and, mm. and, and, you know, connect with and to make this an even bigger ball, you know, to get rolling across the country. And so it's really like a promise to all the people that we've worked with, as well as a promise that the people we can work with. Um, and so it's, you know, Tyler is a person that does not leave a project unfinished. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas I am not to say that I want to not finish this cause right. I absolutely do, but, yeah. um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a project that we need to finish. We've said that we're going to do it. So we're going to do it. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> what, where, what States, is it like a clump of States or are they sort of spread out? Yeah. So, um, I'll speak to that. Cause Tyler always, he's like, uh, I think the Dakotas and I'm like, let me just do it. I know what does the map. <laughs> um, so we have 13 States left, which is fitting for project or, you know, episode, this episode, episode, yeah, episode 13. 13. I, I didn't even know that. 13. And, uh, the initial States in the, Oh yeah. 13 colonies. Yeah, 13 I know colonies. someone was like, imagine if you would have just left the colonies left. I'm like, God, oh, yeah, that was a good idea. Um, so we, uh, have Alabama, Georgia, West Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the Dakotas left. Okay. Wow. Cool. Listen wow. Off. Nice. <laughs> That's really good. You said you're not organized. I, know, yeah. I, I like the map portion of, <laughs> of the logistics and organizing and stuff. And, you know, well, route. you left Fargo for last. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one more and question. Michigan, sorry. Oh my gosh. You, oh, what, I, <laughs> well, technically, you've, you've done, done Michigan, Michigan a bunch yeah. of times, yeah. but you're going to do it again. Is like, it like the final? Yeah, like, it's we the wanted final. Michigan to be the, the last, awesome. the homecoming one. It's cool. going to be so hard for you guys to find a. So I'm going to do the video part. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know anybody. Yeah. Um, I, I do have one more question and let's, uh, 
as we kind of wind this down, um, is, is there anything that like if someone is actually listening to this, if they want to know, know more about this or just in general, like where you guys are at in your, your journey that you'd like to share with them? Because I th- think what we've been talking about is kind of the meaningful story that of your guys' experience going through this. And you guys are doing that in your work on a regular basis. I mean, I, I, if you look at your Has Hearts website or even your 21 website, their meaningful stories is something that like kind of transcends all the stuff that you do. And I, I guess like, is there anything you want to communicate to the people that would be listening to this that is in line with that? Yeah, well, as you guys know more than anyone, you know, it's the stories that really connect us. Um, and so that's kind of our driving mission and and purpose for doing the tour and finishing the 50 states is that connection that I think our country currently, you know, everyone says it's the most divided it's it's ever been. Um, But when you're kind of on the ground trying to combat that, you see how that's not necessarily Mm -hmm. true. If we take the time and effort to connect, then it is much easier for that to kind of ripple out into the the communities. And so I think just focusing on uh, design that is meaningful and storytelling that is meaningful and the things that I guess matter in life that you can do through your skills and talents and profession is really um, you know, our plea for, you know, anyone out there listening is to whatever you can do to figure out a way to do it. Um, and it's a struggle at times. Obviously, we've been living in Kendra's parents' basement for the past four or five months trying to raise... That's the struggle? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Um, Love you, mom and dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the struggle when you're used to living in a right, airstream right. trailer on the yeah. road. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's just figuring out ways to get things done and having a, a vision and mission and kind of every day taking steps towards it. And so I think one of the encouraging posts that Kendra put in front of her desk um, recently. Do you want to share that? Oh, man. Don't put me on the spot. I don't remember it now. It doesn't have to be word for word. Is well, it a cat poster that says hang in there? Oh, I wish. <laughs> um, it's a, well, it's a post about progress. Progress is progress no matter, you know, how slow. It, that's kind mm. of the gist of it. So, I mean, and that's, I mean, that I feel like embodies you with your Tyler. I'm pointing at him. Sorry. It's okay. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> um, embodies you with like your your path and stuff and like slowly working at it. Um, but yeah. And I think to, to further what Tyler, um, just said, I think putting yourself out there as well, like there's so much that you can do, but also sort of challenging yourself to get out of your comfort zone. Um, I think obviously someone could hear that and say, Oh yeah, I'm good at this. I'll like, let me just do this and stay within their like mm-hmm. little, yeah. you know, path and, and whatnot. But really it, it does take you kind of jumping out there and doing it in person is really the key. And I think we're all so used to connecting online and email and stuff and, and communicating. That's a great catalyst. Um, but I think like the true, you know, power in action in, is, in like the face-to-face interactions yeah, absolutely. absolutely and and collaborations and efforts and and whatnot um yeah. so really like sitting down what can i do how can i make that happen yeah and also evaluating okay is that worth it to me and if it is then do it you know mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and so yeah it's it's been a big effort but it's one that like i i wouldn't reg- i mean i don't regret it i totally been out of my comfort zone for like the last two years and it was really scary for someone with anxiety to like be continually changing places and whatnot, but I've grown so, so, so much. Um, and it's, it's just to, you know, I attribute it to people really like connecting with people and relating to them has made me like realize so much about myself, um, than I ever could have in, you know, just living in Grand Rapids, continuing on with like our, our lives, like you asked earlier. I think that's like one of the most valuable messages that like can be shared right now right like this idea of like everything just feels so siloed and especially when it's reinforced by you know social media algorithms or whatever and i agree with you it's it's we even say this oftentimes in marketing meetings or whatever it's like even if we're designing a thing even if we're telling a story in a video form or whatever like 
what is the point of that thing? Well, it's just to get to a human connection. That's the only thing that will actually change someone's behavior or their mind or their attitude or whatever. And I think like that's such a good um, bit of advice to like leverage. Well, what do you have that you can leverage in, into, you know, a conversation or a touch point with a person rather than just sort of going like, well, I did my part, type, 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 walk away. It's just, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't do it. How can you use your own skills to, to further that? I love that about your mission. It's so yeah. cool. So um, wrap up wise, well, I'm going to definitely leave all the information of what we're doing with Has Heart. And then we also have a video that we're going to be working with you guys on that. If you want to learn more about them, that's going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks. There will be an opportunity, I think, to help, help, help. them if, yeah, if in whatever to. way it makes sense. And yeah. um, This will launch before I think there's like an ask or whatever. But if you are interested, you can reach out to Tyler or Kendra through their website or through Instagram or whatever. Yeah. If you are interested in partnering with them, like we're... We're, we're going to get them through the last 13 states one way or another. Yeah, so we're, we want to help with that. We definitely want so. people to be involved. Yeah, but guys, that. thank you so much for being on the podcast. This is really fun. Thank you for saying what you just did when it comes to the meaningful stories. That's um, It's a really wonderful why, and it's a really wonderful reason to keep going on this stuff. And I, I'm just really impressed with you guys as people. And uh, we wish nothing but the best for you if, from a gorilla standpoint, um, and just as people, like we're, we're rooting for you and we really want this to, we want you to see this mission through. This is, I mean, this is interesting too, because to this point, I mean, this podcasting thing is still really new for us. Right. Right. And so we've spent, to this point, we've sort of been working within our closest sphere, sort of telling the stories of people that we're closest to. And this has been really cool because you guys are sort of coming into this, you're sort of the inaugural um Other. guess for us where you're really <laughs> unpacking um, I didn't know that yeah, yeah it's exciting. been a lot of like yeah. and this has been our intent right we're expanding yeah. sort of the boundaries of what we're doing but we've been working the kinks out so it's been really fun to be in a position where it's like okay j- just shut the fuck up <laughs> and listen right now you know what I mean for me because you guys have so much wisdom and you've learned so much and I think it's really inspiring so thank you well thank you are you kidding me yeah thank you guys <laughs> um I just want to kind of quickly say, like, we appreciate what Gorilla is doing to help us share this story and this mission because uh, we've talked about being able to try and uh, pay the creatives. And we came to a point with you guys when uh, our bank account said insufficient funds, and yet you guys were so eager to help us share that story. So we really appreciate what you guys have done for us. So thank you. Of course. Yeah, we're going to get there. Yeah. We're going to get all those dates. Like, I feel, I feel like Kendra just did like a hard thing and I was like, that's what I was thinking in my head. <laughs> and I was like, thank you for doing that. I was like, I'm going to be too cheesy if I'm the one that did it. Kendra beat me to the punch. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. All right, thank you thanks, for being on guys. here. Yeah. Um, we're signing off. All right. Awesome. Thanks.